we're going to start a new series of videos. This is going to be on the plasma membrane and it's going to be a series of three videos. The first of the videos is going to cover the structure of the plasma membrane and a little bit of the evidence for why we think it has the structure that it does. And in the second two videos we're going to cover transport across the membrane and some of its other functions such as cell signaling. In order to think about the structure of a membrane we first of all have to think about this molecule. This molecule is a phospholipid. You've met lipids from GCSE biology. Uh, you've met them as a biological molecule, they had three fatty acids and they were attached to one molecule of glycerol. Well here, instead of having three fatty acid chains, well here for the phospholipid we have two fatty acid chains here. Now in place of the third fatty acid chain we have a phosphate group added on. So on glycerol there are three binding sites. At GCSE we learned about fats having one, two and three fatty acids. What I draw in what would be called a triglyceride. It would look like this with glycerol there and three fatty acids here. Well for a phospholipid what happens instead we have our glycerol like that and we have a fatty acid, a fatty acid, and then here instead a phosphate group in place of a fatty acid chain. Now this phosphate group is what makes our phospholipids so special. It is polar and hydrophilic, whereas the rest of the molecule is very, very non-polar and hydrophobic. We'll have a little more of a think about hydro being hydrophilic or hydrophobic uh, in the next video, but let's just uh, leave it for the moment as saying if you've got a whole load of carbons bonded to a whole load of hydrogens, there's very little electron disparity between them. They will hold on to their electrons equally strongly, very nearly equally strongly, and therefore they don't generate any polarity around the, molec around the molecule and therefore they end up being hydrophobic for reasons that we'll discuss when we think about the structure of water. So in due course of time hopefully you'll be able to explain why a polar group should be hydrophilic and why a non-polar group should be hydrophobic. That property of having a hydrophilic head and, hydrophobic, and having hydrophobic tails gives our phospholipids their arrangement. Cells are wet. They occur in wet situations, they're wet inside them and typically they're surrounded by extracellular fluid and so are wet outside as well. When you put phospholipids into water they want to arrange their hydrophobic tails in a way such that they're pointing away from water. They want to keep them out of the water but the phosphate heads don't mind being in the water and therefore they form up what is called a bilayer with the phosphate heads embedded into the water and in here we have those, those fatty acid tails and that is called the hydrophobic core. This gives us the basis of a cell membrane. Well if we've got a phospholipid bilayer as the basis of it, what else is in it? We know from chemical analysis that there are proteins in the cell membrane. And by the way, when I, cell sem when I say cell membrane now, what I mean is all of the membranes in a cell. We should no longer refer to what is the plasma membrane or the cell surface membrane as being the cell membrane because there are so many membranes in a cell. So let's get into the habit of saying CSM uh, as our outer membrane. This is some evidence for the structure of plasma membranes, of cell membranes. This technique is called freeze fracture imaging and you can see here our technique. We put a cell in a block of ice and we make it very, very cold and then we shatter this block of ice and this cell and hopefully it will just shatter along a line of weakness. Now, we don't know where that line of weakness is going to be. It will shatter to an extent at random, but we can get rather beautiful patterns given off by it and we can use that as evidence for the structure of cell membranes. Here we have a model of what we think might have happened when we do this. 
let's say the knife happened to cut in just at the gap between the two layers of the phospholipid bilayer. Now if it does split like that, we'll have an extracellular layer peeling off that way, uh, an intracellular layer or a cytoplasmic layer peeling off this way, and these are proteins which potentially will stud it. What would this look like? Because of course this is just a model here, this would just be speculation as to what it would actually be. What do we actually see? Using a scanning electron uh, microscope, we generate these scanning electron micrographs and this is what we see. The extracellular surface of the membrane comes out looking like this. Uh, you, you can see dots, well that's really from the patterning of the image itself. Um, you can see some bumps coming through but in particular when you split it open you see many more bumps on this side here. These bumps correspond to proteins. Uh, here inside of the extracellular layer you can see there are quite a few proteins coming through but when you get into the cytoplasmic layer you can see very many. So what this implies is that there are some proteins which go all the way through and there are some proteins which don't. And this leads us to the conclusion really that the membrane, that a cell membrane, is structured like a mosaic. The basis of it is a phospholipid bilayer with these phospholipids here forming up the bilayer. Uh, you notice there are various different colours associated, associated with these phospholipids. Uh, partly that's other things going on in there such as cholesterol molecules, but also you have actually quite a family of phospholipid molecules that we don't really need to worry about at ASA2. Uh, but there are other things like sphingolipids in there and variants of phospholipids. Now nestled in amongst those phospholipids are these proteins. This one here penetrates all the way through, that is an intrinsic protein and this protein here is just on one side, that might be on the internal or the external face and that is an extrinsic protein. Let me just scroll those down, so this one is intrinsic and this one is extrinsic. So it's a mosaic. Well, it's also fluid. This is an old experiment that was done at about the time that we were trying to figure out how membranes were structured. It was a clever little experiment and it involved the use of antibodies. A mouse cell will have mouse proteins on it, no surprise there, and we can raise antibodies against those mouse proteins and those mouse, the antibodies will come along and they'll bind to the mouse proteins like this and I could carry on colouring these in but I won't. Oh well I say that and here we go. Now of course human cells will have human proteins on their cell surface membrane and we can raise antibodies against them as well. Let's change the colour to a nice kind of turquoisey greeny type colour. And you can see these colours quite clearly if you use immunofluorescence microscopy and then what you can do is you can fuse these two cells. Comme ça. You fuse the cells together. Two things might happen. One, you may find that they don't mix and that the colours simply stay separate. So we have our reds staying absolutely separate from our greens. But in reality what we see is that there's a great deal of intermingling between these two, suggesting that the membrane itself is fluid and it allows lateral diffusion of proteins. They can diffuse around the cell membrane and that they found that the surface proteins were completely intermixed within minutes, giving us evidence for the cell membrane's fluidity. More evidence comes from this technique, from FRAP, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. Let's say we make uh, a phospholipid bilayer using phospholipids which fluoresce. They fluoresce when a particular frequency of light is shone on them. They uh, absorb some of that light and re-emit it at a slightly lower frequency and we can pick up that fluorescence using fluorescence microscopy. What you can do to a fluorescent molecule is give it a good old blast with far too much light. 
So if you observe this cell membrane using a fluorescence microscope, you'll just see loads of red here. Let's say it was fluorescing red, and that's the particular frequency it's fluorescing at. Well, now let's give it a good old blast with far too much light, as shown here. And you will get a black dot in the middle of your field of view. This black dot is sharp and is very dark in comparison to everything else. Normalized fluorescence intensity, that's on our y-axis here, i.e. how much fluorescence is there. A is during this bit here, and then B is in the middle of that spot. And in the middle of that spot, you'll see there's very little fluorescence. Now, over time, this is time on our x-axis, the fluorescence rises. Why does it rise? Well, the only real explanation for why it rises is because of diffusion. Diffusion of undamaged fluorescing phospholipids into the area of the spot. And as they diffuse in, so the fluorescence in the middle of the spot increases. And it increases towards an asymptote which will be just below the original level of fluorescence. Why just below? Well, because we've still got these non-fluorescing phospholipid molecules around the place here. So again, this is evidence for lateral diffusion. And this is uh, this little diagram here. So lateral diffusion, this one diffusing that way. That leads us to the fluid mosaic model. And the fluid mosaic model includes in it a number of different molecules. It gives, of course, our phospholipid bilayer but there are things nestled in that phospholipid bilayer. Let's start off with this one here. This is an extrinsic protein, and attached to that extrinsic protein is this bit here, a polysaccharide. Now, that polysaccharide I've abbreviated here as CHO, that's my abbreviation for carbohydrate, quite a common one, and it gives this glycoprotein, glycoprotein is a protein with a bit of carbohydrate attached to it, and that gives this glycoprotein a very specific three-dimensional shape. Now that very specific three-dimensional shape is extremely useful for cell-to-cell -cell recognition, uh, such as for antigen recognition, cell adhesion, sends binding to other cells, and it can act as a receptor, such as for hormones. These carbohydrate groups are also sometimes attached not onto a protein, but onto a phospholipid. And uh, so maybe you could draw another one like this. That would be a glycolipid. So that's one part. Glycoprotein, glycolipid. This here is an intrinsic protein. And this one is a channel protein. It acts for, as a channel for molecules that otherwise cannot cross the hydrophobic core. And we'll think about that more in the next video. But, for example, ions and sugars and amino acids cannot cross this hydrophobic core. These channel proteins are going to be crucial in facilitated diffusion and in active transport. It's worth thinking now about protein domains. We've got these proteins here nestled in the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid bilayer. We've got these parts of the proteins out in the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid, the watery bits. Proteins are made out of amino acids, and different amino acids have different physical properties. The amino acids which are hydrophilic will be the ones on this side of the proteins, the side which is exposed to the watery bit, whereas the amino acids in these bits here particularly the ones not right in the middle of the channel, because they will probably be hydrophilic, because water will be allowed through there potentially, and certainly ions will be allowed through there, so it needs to be hydrophilic in the core of it. But any bit that is coming into contact with the hydrophobic core of the bilayer will also be hydrophobic. It will be non-polar and hydrophobic. They will be hydrophobic amino acids. This molecule is cholesterol. We need cholesterol. It's not a bad molecule. Yes, we can have probably too much of it in our blood and potentially it causes problems, but we need it in our cell membranes. What cholesterol does is it maintains both the fluidity and the structure of the membrane. It keeps it not too fluid and not too rigid. It's a very useful molecule. In fact, cholesterol has a little OH group 
on this tip of it and that OH group just lets it nestle into the hydrophilic head layer of the phospholipid bilayer whereas most of the molecule here is very hydrophobic and that will stay there. Cholesterol by the way is also the starting off point for most steroid synthesis so testosterone, estrogen will be made from initially a cholesterol substrate. So we've got here another intrinsic protein and we're just highlighting this to uh, bring up another property of proteins. We talked earlier about human proteins and mouse proteins being free to intermingle around a cell membrane. Now that is true for a lot of proteins but some proteins are not free to diffuse around the membrane because they may be fixed in place by an internal cytoskeleton. So there may be internal fibers coming on to this protein and binding it in place. These internal fibers form the cytoskeleton and you will have learned about them in your previous module on cell structure. And as a final question, just to see if you're awake, how might the chemical properties of this protein vary between these two regions? Thank you.